And uh, at one point, we were spending over $100,000 a month on our CI bill. No way. Oh, God forbid he has lint. Like, I don't know. <laughs> Today's podcast is going to be an interesting one. I am a big fan of GitHub Actions. Been using GitHub Actions basically ever since it came out. Uh, we have a course on boot.dev about GitHub Actions, but Richard Feldman, a guest maybe five or six episodes back, reached out to me and said, you need to have Tommy Graves on to talk about CI and CD. And you know he works at rwx.com on a product called Mint, which is basically a GitHub Actions competitor. So Tommy's here to explain to us what we are doing so wrong in the GitHub Actions world and in the CI CD world. So uh, Tommy, go ahead and introduce yourself. Thanks for having me, Lane. And uh, I don't know if I want it to be so combative, but <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited to talk about kind of what we've seen with GitHub Actions and what we're trying to improve on there. But I'm Tommy. I'm uh, the co-founder at RWX, which is, I guess we call ourselves a dev tools startup. So we're building building tooling to help developers. And uh, right now our primary focus is on, you said, Mint CI, which is our continuous integration platform. Before RWX, if I can just give like a little yeah. history of like how we got here. My co-founder and I, we both were uh, in engineering leadership at Root Insurance, which is a car insurance startup. And uh, at one point we were spending over $100,000 a month on our CI bill. No way. So That's crazy. <laughs> it's, it was Pretty crazy. Um, and I can talk a little bit about, you know, what, how we were spending that much, but basically we had a complex product. It had a different configuration for every state in the United States. And we had a really intense, you know, integration test suite that ran the tests against every single state's configuration. So it was hours and hours of CI time for every, every push that an engineer made. What programming language like was primarily being like built and, and ran? Mostly Rails, although we also had a real ah, it was there just because it was Rails. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's definitely a piece of it. You know, we were hitting the database and all these tests and whatnot, but that definitely a part of it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, that's cool though. Yeah, yeah, we built a bunch of this tooling to try to cut down on our CI time, try to avoid wasting time doing stuff that we knew was going to pass or we knew was going to fail, that sort of thing. And then uh, after I moved on from there, I found myself building this tooling again. And sort of again <laughs> and again. <laughs> and so when my co-founder and I decided to start our review, actually, we were looking at the problems that we had found ourselves kind of solving over and over and over again. And tooling to help you spend less in CI and make your CI faster was definitely one of those primary ones. So that's kind of how we ended up in the in the spot where we're building a whole CI platform. It's pretty cool. It's interesting to hear that like you were like building all of this custom tooling everywhere you went because I mean for most of my career there's been options on the market. We could argue about whether they're good options or not, but like you know you've got Circle, you've got Jenkins, you've got GitLab runners, GitHub Actions. What was like the big pain point? Why were you rolling custom solutions so often? Yeah, so at these previous roles, we actually were building them on top of other solutions. So like at root we were using BuildKite, which is a fairly like DIY platform already. Like you provide your own infrastructure for BuildKite to run instead of them running it for you like you would in say GitHub Actions. But um, you know, we found there were a number of limitations with those platforms. And actually when we started RWX, we were trying to build some of this tooling on top of GitHub Actions. So we have a couple of products that help you do test parallelization and flaky test detection and that sort of thing that work with GitHub Actions. But we kept running into these limitations of the platform that made it hard for us to really do the full thing that we wanted to do. And at some point, we just said, I think we have to build our own CI platform to actually <laughs> release some of these limitations. And some of them are silly. It's things like the GitHub Actions API doesn't tell you the ID of a job easily. So it's really hard when running run a job into that one to, I've, yes, yeah. to connect it to API calls. Some of them are things like that. Others are, let's say, more sophisticated <laughs> restrictions with the system. Like the only way to do caching in GitHub Actions is basically to upload kind of arbitrary blobs to S3 and then restore them, which means if you're in like a really complex project, your caching options are maybe uploading and downloading 10 gigabytes of data on every single build which ends up being really slow, even though you're trying to use caching, things like that. I've got so many things to say about what you just said. But first, <laughs> I want to rewind because I just realized we sure. may have lost some of our like beginner developers that are listening sure. to this. They've probably, you know, 
a lot of our listeners are boot dev students and they've probably seen that like the learn CICD course is like course number 18 in our learning path. It's like, oh, this is like some crazy, big, scary thing. It's actually not. It's it's actually one of the easier courses in the platform and it's one of the easier things to wrap your head around. Um, it just can feel a little scary. So let's start with what is continuous integration? It's a great question. <laughs> and it's one we've struggled with a little bit. So actually when we first started building Mint, we called it a build tool not a CI platform. So we were thinking of ourselves with like, I guess make is probably the tool that people are most likely to be familiar with, but you know, basically well, we think of Mint as a way to execute things, <laughs> uh, which is incredibly generic. Now, as it turns out, continuous integration, most people use their CI platforms to execute test suites, maybe linters, compilers. Uh, they also use it for like deploying their software. That's kind of the range of things. It's typically things that you want to do in response to somebody, say, pushing a commit up to like GitHub repository or maybe after a pull request is merged. Like whatever automated tasks you want to run when those things happen, that's kind of what I see fitting in the purview of continuous integration platform. To really like to zoom out, it's like a new change has been committed to a code base, right? And this is in the context of like you're working on a developer team usually, right? So somebody on the team made a change to the code base. We want to do something in an automated way that's run the test suite, make sure they didn't push some code that breaks the tests, make sure they didn't push some code that breaks like the linting or the formatting rules that we have set up. In the case of Python, that might be like black formatter. In the case of Go, it might be like Go fumped. And then you also mentioned deployment. That might be classified as a different thing. That might be continuous deployment. But like you said, it is kind of all fuzzy and we get to draw the lines kind of however we want. Yeah, I think I think that's exactly right. You originally building the product on top of GitHub Actions, you ran into some limitations. What's the big what's what's the big deal? What are we what are we trying to solve here that isn't easily solved on other CI CD platforms? Yeah. I think the thing I would call the core idea, the biggest idea behind it, although there are a lot of other ones that I'm, I'm excited to talk about as well, but the core idea is that log output is not really the best way to consume the results of a CI platform. And the thing that most people are doing with a CI platform is consuming results. So for most engineers, probably a lot of the people you were talking about who maybe are going through the 18th chapter of your, <laughs> right? Um, most, most people there are probably not configuring CI platforms themselves very frequently, but they are probably using them every single day. Most engineers, every time they make a change, they push it to say GitHub and they see some tests are running. They might not have any idea, like how did the test start running? Why are the tests running? But they see they're running and they get a big red X when they fail, <laughs> you know? And then they're like, oh, that's what's important or they can't merge their PR until they click on the X and see what's going on with it. And so the thing is with GitHub Actions and with many other CI platforms, like the primary way that you then figure out what happened is you read a bunch of logs. And that can be, that can be totally fine if you're using a test framework that has really great log output and your CI platform is configured really well. So the most important stuff is at the bottom or at the top and you're not scrolling through hundreds of logs trying to figure out what went on. But really what most people are trying to do most of the time is figure out what test failed and what it failed with or figure out on what line did my linter fail. And so with Lint, whenever you run, we call them tasks, whenever you run a task, we know what kind of task you're running. We know whether it's a test or you're linting a file or like say you're deploying somewhere or you're compiling some code, you're doing type checking on a code base. And we totally change the interface of the Mint results based on what you're trying to do. So if it's a test failure, you'll see a red box that says the file that had the test in it, the name of the test that shows you what was expected and what what it actually got that caused the test to fail. If um, if it's a lint failure, you see a slightly different interface that that tells you the lint message. You can always fall back to the logs if you know something went catastrophically wrong or you're digging in for something else. But what most people are trying to do most of the time is view a very specific nugget of information. And with most CI platforms, that nugget is just hidden in hundreds, hundreds of irrelevant log lines. And so we're really trying to bring that to the forefront so that when you're using Mint, you see immediately the most important thing. Two things here. 
So first, I want to make sure I'm understanding correctly. It sounds to me like the the big value then of, of what you guys are uh, are trying to accomplish is like essentially better UI UX on top of a CI platform. So instead of a thousand lines of standard out or standard error and a zero or one exit code on some step in essentially a giant like bash script, you're, you're giving like structured output. We call it semantic output. So it's it's meaningful output that is tied to the type of thing you were trying to do. Got it. And because it's semantic or structured or whatever, like I'm guessing your like web platform parses that and can show different visuals and get you to the root of the problem. Okay, that sounds fascinating and interesting because like I've definitely run into these problems where I've worked on smaller projects. So my guess is, or yeah, my guess is my pain points on my smaller projects has not been as large as like in the scenario you described where you got this giant Rails app that's like taking hours to run CI and it's got tens of thousands of logs of uh, lines of logs. But I see that I see that being extremely valuable. My follow up question is, this seems like really hard to do right, because in theory, customers are going to input their the, the, like things they want to do in their CI runner. So I want to run go test, right? And then I want to run go fumped. And you're not going to be able to anticipate exactly all the things they're going to want to do because sometimes it's some weird shit. And I feel like all you can rely on is like, okay, there's going to be standard out and standard error and there's going to be an exit code, zero or one. Is that all that you guys get to rely on in order to like parse that and try to make it more meaningful? You know, it actually turns out that most of the popular tools already support making this fairly easy. So almost every single test framework can output test results to a file in one form or fashion. They almost all support this standard called JUnit, which is just like a very simple XML format of test results. Although they Ew, all XML. Gross. Is is this coming from the Java world? Is that JUnit? <laughs> it is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we should not have looked to them for a standard, but uh, all right. Yeah, most most test frameworks have their own like bespoke output as well. Uh, so for for test results, we tell you like, hey, you need to configure your test framework to spit out the results to this file here, and and we've got a great guide on like you know the twenty most popular test frameworks. So, like it's usually like you change one line in the command you're running, or you add one configuration option, and then you're good to go. With a lot of other tools, we are pretty much just parsing the logs and then turning it into like a structured output for you. But again, actually a lot of the hard work has already been done for us because there are other tools like say probably your editor and even some like GitHub Actions plugins themselves that have already set up all these like great regular expressions and ways to like scan log output and pull out structured data from them. And so we're piggybacking on a lot of that which was great for us because it helped us actually focus on like building the UI and the UX instead of spending, you know, hours and days just like trying to figure out what the log output of ESLint or something looks like and, and parse it. Oh, God forbid ESLint. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I guess it could be worse. You could be running Webpack. I'm guessing a lot of your uh, customers are running Webpack. <laughs> <laughs> I'm starting to see the world move off of Webpack, and I'm very excited <laughs> about it. <laughs> yeah, so the world's moving off of Webpack. I'm guessing like you're seeing a lot of movement to Vite, probably? Yeah, and Vtest as well. As it turns out, most of our users so far are actually on Rails or Python, and that's where they're seeing the uh, the biggest problems that they like need like a more powerful CI platform to solve. So we, we have less JavaScript than... Um, than you might expect. I think a piece of that also is that we only just last week released Mint in like an open beta where you can go and sign up. So we've been working, you know, with fewer like say individuals, people going through tutorials and whatnot, which I think is where like, you know, everyone's using JavaScript for that stuff. So I, I'm anticipating seeing a lot more of that in in the next few months as we start to really ramp up our our marketing and bringing more users on board. Well, if more advanced boot dev students start using Mint, then hopefully you'll see a lot more Go projects coming down the pipeline. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Tell me a little bit about like the benefit of this structured and semantic logging. Obviously, like I think we've covered the fact that it's going to like look prettier on the web page. You'll be able to get to the root of the problem easier. Is there any like in code benefits like structured parsing of the Mint output and like you know being able to trigger off of that? Is, is that something that you guys are working on as well? Yeah, so we, ha we have that feature as well. So say you want to run some task only when certain tests fail, 
in another test. So you're on your test suite, you're looking for like this one particular test fails. And when it does, you want to, I don't know, say send a Slack notification to someone or something like that. We expose in our, in our configuration language, the ability to actually examine the results of the previous task and then do different things based on them. So you can say, run a task only if a previous task had five or more test failures, um, or if it had a particular lint failure, that sort of thing. So it does give you a programmable interface where you can interact with those results as well. To give a little bit of background, our CI CD course on BootDev, everything on BootDev is extremely interactive. So you're like writing code in the browser or you're writing code on your local machine and you're hooking into like the BootDev test suite, basically. And our CI CD course uses GitHub Actions and Basically, the way the whole course works is like you're writing YAML file on your local machine that describes your GitHub Actions, you're pushing it up to your branch, and then we've integrated behind the scenes with like the GitHub API to see the state of your job. And earlier when I said like there's like no job ID or whatever, I remember like we have to grab the whole workflow and kind of like parse it down. Like we still were able to work, get it to work, but it's probably not exactly how we'd like it to be. It sounds to me like then that the API you guys are working on keeps that in mind? like up front? Yeah, so there's kind of two different sides of it. One is when you're actually writing the YAML to configure it, you could you could do some of this stuff in YAML if, if you want to write your own bespoke custom code that interfaces with your results. For the thing you're talking about, I mean, we also have like an API you could hit later after your job has run to pull all the results down. And that API even has some fairly rich data. Like it can tell you the history of flaky tests that you've introduced into your test suite. It allows you to, we have this feature called quarantining, where you basically say, hey, if this test fails in the future, I don't want it to fail my mint build. I just, I, I, want, I want to keep running the test, but anytime it fails, I, I don't want to treat that as a failure, which is useful if you know, you're trying to debug something, but you don't want to block everyone from being able to merge their PI. PRs or whatever while you're doing it. So we, we kind of have it on on both ends, within Mint itself, and then we expose it to the world through our API as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, I, I want to circle back to, you talked about, you were at this company and you had $100,000 in monthly spend on CI CD, which is like, first of all, it's like bonkers to me. A at Boot Dev, we make pretty heavy use of CI and CD. Like we like that kind of thing, but we're a small team. You know, there's, there's seven of us right now. And we don't pay anything for GitHub Actions at the moment because we're like still under the free tier. And I mean, we are running Go, which like compiles really fast and stuff. So like it, there's some efficiency there. But like 100K is, is nutty. The, the largest company I was at, we were spending a little over 100K a month on like our total cloud spends, so like hosting for the actual application and database and everything. Our, again, our CI CD at that company with $100,000 in cloud spend was like a few hundred bucks, maybe, right? Like may maybe a thousand dollars. I don't think it was even that high. Does Mint m make it cheaper for companies like that that have insanely high CI spend? Earlier, I said, you know, kind of the core idea of Mint is like basically this better UX around results. But there's another core idea too, <laughs> which is content-based caching. Two cores, exactly. <laughs> and actually, this is the idea we started with. We call it content-based caching. Basically, Mint looks at the contents of all the files that are on the file system when it's running your tasks. And if those contents haven't changed, or more broadly speaking, if, it's, if you've already done the work to run this task before, we cache the results of it, and then we bring in that cache instead of executing it again. And you can make this as granular, you know, fine-grained as you want. So you could say for every individual test in your test suite, these are the files that that test is going to read. And if none of those have changed, then you know the result of the test isn't going to change. And so instead of running, say, 100,000 tests every time an engineer pushes a new branch, you might only run 10 to 20 tests, which yeah. <laughs> you can pretty quickly see how that will cut down on your spend if you're paying per minute or, or even per task that you execute or anything like that. So why isn't everyone doing this? Why isn't GitHub? Like, it seems so obvious to me. Well, I think there's probably three, three aspects for why not everyone is doing it. One is it can be hard to configure. So by default, you probably are using all of the files, or you're at least like, you know, every GitHub Actions workflow, for instance, starts with action slash checkout, which is like clones your whole repository, and now you have all of your files available to you. So without doing anything, say, sophisticated, it's going to be really hard to know that like, hey, if I change the readme, like, is that going to break these tests or not? If you're building this in GitHub Actions, you need to like 
do some sort of configuration, some sort of analysis on your code to figure out exactly what all the dependencies look like. So that, that piece can be challenging. Another side of it is that depending on what you're doing, it might actually not be a performance benefit. And you have to be really careful with this. So like one, one way that Mint works is you might say install your dependencies. So like I check out my code, I run NPM install or bundle install, whatever, whatever your programming language uses to install your dependencies. And so we'll cache that for you. That's a very common thing that gets cached in, in Mint because usually it's really easy to know how to cache that. For JavaScript, for instance, you just need a package.json file and then like a lock file. And that's basically the, the only two files that are going to determine what dependencies get installed. But the problem is, is, and this is especially true in JavaScript, less true in Go, but running npm install might, might install multiple gigabytes of packages <laughs> onto your machine. For a big project, it might be hundreds of gigabytes. It's a disaster, yeah. It, like Trash Dev recently pushed that like npm package called everything that just has every literal thing as a as a secondary dependency or as a what's it called a transient transient dependency <laughs> so like it can get pretty bad yeah i'm it can get bad we have to store that somewhere and then we have to restore it if you want to actually use that somewhere so it actually turns out in some cases that it's slower for us to archive those files put them somewhere and then bring them back in than it is to just install them anew. And I think like this problem ends up scaring a lot of people off of this type of solution because you have to be pretty smart about how you're storing the data and when you're say purging the data to not like either cause just your storage spend to go way up or your network spend because you're suddenly you know downloading and uploading all these bytes or or even just like your actual performance the amount of time it's taking. You can. Um, fairly easily end up in a worse situation than if you just had no caching. And then I think the third reason why teams don't do this is because a lot of the developers of the tools that lead to problems where you would actually want to start using caching like this don't themselves actually run into those problems because they're not at the scale that, say, like a 500-person engineering team is at. And so like the tools themselves just often don't like have great support for, like the, one of the examples I gave, right, was you do this on an individual test level. But most test frameworks don't allow you to say like, I wanna run just like this one test and then maybe this other, or like this, this 10 set of tests without you like feeding in the 10 tests through the command line. They don't usually have like programmatic interfaces for you to do this, which ends up making it harder. Right, because you have to do some weird stuff where you're like, dynamically generating the command line inputs and <laughs> okay i could see how that would be frustrating and so like yeah i get why teams don't get it what still doesn't quite make sense to me is like why doesn't why doesn't github do it right like you think they'd save so much money by like having smarter caching and like i know they don't have smarter caching because again like i look at the github actions that we're running at boot dev and like they're extremely wasteful I mean, again, they take just like a minute or two. And so it's not like this huge pain point for us yet, but I could easily see it becoming a pain point when there's like none of this kind of solved out of the box. The pessimistic answer is that they get paid when you run more stuff on the platform. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I, I, I don't know if that's, if that's the case or not. I think more likely it is that if you looked at the distribution of projects on GitHub Actions, the percentage of projects that actually would benefit from the kind of caching that Mint does is way outweighed by, say, the hundreds of thousands of open source projects that just like are too small to actually run into the performance bottlenecks that require you to start looking at solutions like this. And, and for that reason, this piece of Mint is really tailored for larger engineering teams or teams that, that are running into almost unique performance problems. Well, and I'm guessing like, they probably pay are willing to pay Mint quite a bit of money if they can reduce CI spend from 100k a month to 10k a month. Is that like the order of magnitude we're working on? That that's the ideal order of magnitude. I think 50% is probably for most people the most realistic. And depending on how bad of a situation you're in, like maybe at some points it's only 10%. But even then, 100k to 90k is still like a fairly substantial savings. So if you would have switched your old project from whatever you were on to Mint. You come down to 50k and then you switch from rails to go and now you're down to 10k like 
we're good to go. Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure, <laughs> <That's not> sure. <laughs> there were definitely attempts to try to switch our project to go <laughs> Rust, but uh, the effort to get there was... Well, Fair Rust would have bumped it back up to 200k because those compile times can get pretty nutty. Yeah, and the engineers that you have to hire to work in Rust are charging you twice as much to work. So True. The UI UX thing to me is definitely like top of mind being in like the smaller startup space because like that's why I use CICD in the first place. Is like I want a better developer experience. I want to know before I deploy that I had all this crap that's broken. It, it, the sooner in the development cycle I can know that I I committed crap, <laughs> the better, right? The faster I'll be able to move. That makes perfect sense to me. Before we started chatting, we were talking a little bit offline about this, and and you said that another thing is like you guys are focused more on the CI side than on the CD side. Right. More on the integration side, which to most people, I think, means like more of a focus on like the linting, formatting and testing than on like the actual deploying of the code up to some like production server. And that there are security implications of using the same platform for both your CI and your CD. Tell, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So I, I do want to lead off with like Mint support CD as well. And one of the reasons for that is because we ourselves often find that we want to kind of combine deployment and testing together. So one thing we often do is like you run your tests on a, a feature branch, you merge that branch into main, we deploy it to staging, which is like our test environment automatically. Then we run some like really heavy like end-to-end -end tests in our staging environment to make sure that everything's like really good to go. And then we deploy the production. And for a little while, we were trying to stay away from continuous delivery altogether. And we had CD running in GitHub Actions and we had all of our CI stuff running in Mint, and it was like bouncing back and forth. Where it's like we deploy and get of actions, run tests in Mint, deploy, deploy again and get of actions, which is like a huge mess. So we we actually do have a number of features that help make CD really easy now. But security is like one of the things that kind of made us afraid <laughs> in, in the first place from doing CD because it's one thing if you have a security hole and like someone can like I don't know view your team's test results or something like that. It's a whole other thing if someone accidentally gets access to deploying to production for you, right? And in some cases, like, it's pretty easy to configure your CI platform such that, like, the secrets that you use to deploy to production are accessible to any feature branch <laughs> that is, you know, running tests. Like, I think mo most small teams have GitHub Action set up like this, where if they have, um, say, like, an AWS key to, to deploy, to production, they might just put it in the like the secrets context and get of actions. And then if somebody, you know, maliciously got access to push code, they could write a workflow that then sends that key to an arbitrary URL for them to exfiltrate it. GitHub Actions has some features to, to help you with this. And they've been adding more and more. So they have this like environments concept where you can say like when this workflow runs, it is deploying to this environment and only workflows that are running on the main branch can deploy to this environment. But in some ways, I feel like that functionality is kind of bolted on. And the thing that is like right in front of you is, hey, you have secrets, put them in this big secrets bucket that anything can read. I um, use the big secrets bucket. I'm sure. a big secrets button. <laughs> <laughs> what, one of my favorite things about the big secrets bucket in GitHub Actions is that you can actually write an expression where you just convert the whole big secrets bucket to JSON and spit it out. Ah, just which, log like, to the console. Yeah, I like the console. It does, it gets stars. But like okay. the fact that like the secrets bucket is truly just like a big bucket that you can just like put into an object and then do whatever you want with it is pretty wild. <laughs> yeah, what do you guys do differently? Yeah, so we have this thing, we call them vaults, which uh, are similar to environments and GitHub Actions, like I just mentioned. So you create a vault, you say that this is either basically like a sensitive vault or a non-sensitive vault. Most of them are likely to be sensitive ones other than like the big bucket for all the stuff you need to run your tests. And then you can figure additional constraints around the vaults, which might be which people are able to access this vault in my organization. If I'm running automatically from a branch, like which branches are, are able to open this vault? There's a variety of configuration like that. And then all secrets, all environment variables, they get put into a specific vault. So we force you to configure where your secrets are going 
thinking about like what's actually going to be able to access them rather than just making it like extremely easy to, <laughs> to just like put the secret in a place where you don't realize that any engineer can suddenly read it. Again, like my, my experience is clouded by how much I've worked at like very small startups, but I can, I can absolutely see as your team grows in size, you need more granular controls, right? Over who can do what. You don't want the intern pushing to production anymore, right? Like we just hired a fairly new developer, less than one year professional experience. He has access to push to production. Uh, and like, we're okay with that. We're a small team. Like we review his code before it goes out, right? Like we do some stuff, but like we're a very small org. When you have 100 engineers, you don't want all 20 of the summer interns without any supervision to be able to accidentally push to production. The like chance of something goes wrong scales up as you add more people to the team. When there's just a couple of people, not as big of a deal. So yeah, like I'm hearing again and again, like I could definitely see how this tool has lots of applications, especially in like maybe the enterprise space or just like larger companies. Yeah, there's a couple of sides of it that are really useful for smaller teams too. So like, let me just talk about two kind of different problems with GitHub Actions in this space. So one that I suspect you've run into is that Dependabot PRs do not have access to any of your secrets. Dependabot PRs get their whole own set of secrets. So if you want, if you want to be able to run tests whenever Dependabot opens a PR, which in case you don't know, like Dependabot is a automatic tool that GitHub provides that like upgrades all of your dependencies for you automatically. So if, if you want to use this tool, it's opening PRs. It's like, hey, I just upgraded Webpack to version 304. And you want to run your tests to make sure that things still work when you do that. Those tests might just like not run at all because they depend on secrets and depending on doesn't have access to them. And the reason for that is because GitHub knows that if say like a dependency is compromised and somebody malicious can just push arbitrary code to that dependency, they could actually exfiltrate your secrets automatically by just publishing that dependency to like NPM or, or whatever your dependency manager is, because the dependabot PR will get opened, that PR will run your arbitrary code, it can do it on install. So it doesn't even have to, um, you know, have anything executed, and then it can exfiltrate all of your secrets. Right? Oh, God, that makes sense. Yeah, I could make an NPM package that's not malicious. And then because I know that a bunch of my users are using the NPM package, and they're using dependabot, I can push a malicious version that like reads secrets. Yeah. And give and like sends them back to my server. Sends them and back then, to yourself. Yeah. And then I just like push that. Dependabot runs automatically. And if if it had access to the secrets, it would just send them all back to my server and like I win. Haha. <laughs> yeah. So to solve this problem, GitHub says Dependabot gets a totally different set of secrets. There's like there's like you gotta go through a couple extra places in the UI to figure out where to put them. Most people, when they're first setting up a project, don't like think about this. So the first time Dependabot opens a PR, they realize, oh, this failed. I have to go <laughs> find all my secret values again, put them in the dependabot one if I want to do that. Or like, I, I suspect what most people actually do is they push their own commit after verifying the dependencies and, and whatnot. So that's that's kind of the first side of, I, I think I said it, two things that, that helps Mint be useful for smaller teams as well. One is like we can avoid that problem with faults altogether because by default with Mint, your actually sensitive secrets are not going to be available to feature branches. The other thing is that in GitHub Actions, it's often very difficult to verify your changes to say like your production deployment workflow, because typically <laughs> what you have to do is either push some changes to main and then like let it deploy and see like, did the YAML change that make just work? Or you have to like really hack That's up your what I workflow. Do. <laughs> push it to main, did it work? Oh no, I guess I'll try again, yeah. <laughs> So with Mint, we have, we call it local execution, but basically it's you can kick off your Mint workflows from a command line tool that we provide. And you can kick off any of your workflows that you want at all. And you can even target specific tasks in the workflows. So if you say only want to run the production deployment and not the staging deployment or vice versa, you can do that from our command line tool. And with Vault, because we allow you to configure that specific people have access to the Vault, you can make it so that when you're working on your production workflow, you can go into the vault that that, that workflow uses and has all the production secrets, request like approval for you to be able to access it temporarily 
your manager or whoever can approve that approval. And then you can kick off your production workflow locally while you're testing it. And you'll have access to all the secrets just for that time period while that approval is valid. Then once you're done, you remove it and your vault is secured again. So it makes it a lot easier to verify changes to things like your production workflows without having to just like push to main and then kind of pray that you didn't make any mistakes. Hey, setting it up with a prayer is my entire development methodology. I've definitely <laughs> accidentally deployed to production while trying <laughs> oh, to no. you know, make changes to staging or something <laughs> while doing that very thing with GitHub Actions. For me, it's usually databases that I have to be very concerned about. I use, it's it's awful. I need a better database client. I use PG Admin 4 to interface with like Postgres databases. And one of the nightmares of PG Admin 4 is that like, on the left-hand side, you have like your list of databases and then you've got your query. The UI to like tell you which database you're connected to at any given time is very non-obvious. In fact, sometimes it can look like you're connected to staging, but you're actually connected to production. And almost all of my like big flubs in like the database world have been due to that. Like, oh, I'm just on staging. Like I'll just delete all the records. Uh <laughs> <laughs> like, oh shit, now I'm spending the rest of the day restoring the production database. I can see how that is uh, extremely useful. One question I have for you is like, rewind five or six years, GitHub Actions wasn't out yet. I can't remember the exact date, but I want to say it was it was just like maybe three or four years ago that GitHub Actions was released. I have 2018 in my head, but I don't, I don't know for sure. That, that could that could definitely be it. I wonder if it also may have been like an alpha beta release. I, I want to say I started using it only maybe four years ago. Before GitHub Actions, I was using, I believe at the time I was using Circle. I'd also used Jenkins. And when GitHub Actions was released, our code was on GitHub. And it was just like such a no brainer at the time to just be like, well, let's just turn off that spend to like Circle or whatever. And we'll just use GitHub Actions now. We just gotta like convert a few YAML files, but it's like basically the same thing. It's just essentially a bash script. And like now we save a little bit of money. Not that like our spend with Circle was crazy, but like really it was like, there's a little bit less complexity because now we don't have to like give everyone access to GitHub and Circle. They just have access to GitHub. Is that what you've seen like entering this space? Has GitHub Actions like really, really become the player in the space or is it still a competitive market? I guess is what I'm asking. Basically, every new startup I talk to is using GitHub Actions. Basically, every startup that is maybe three years old or so and is starting to really scale is facing problems with GitHub Actions that <laughs> makes them want to consider moving to something else. But it's hard. I mean, the, the vendor lock in with GitHub Actions is very real because the ecosystem is just so strong, right? Like, you want to do almost anything, there's an action, which is their like reusable plugin thing. There's an action for that. You want to send a Slack message, you just use like Slack slash send message or whatever. And, like you don't have to do anything. <laughs> it just works. And, and other platforms don't have don't have those those plugins, or they definitely don't have as rich of an environment of those plugins. So yeah, it seems to me like it actions is taking over the world from what I can see. It's funny that you say that. So like, I've definitely noticed that like there's some useful actions out there. I believe at the moment, like I'm using. So obviously, there's like the checkout action that everyone uses, but like there's a setup go action that we can like build and test with our go tool chain we've got a setup google cloud i think that like essentially installs like the g cloud command line i think actually those are the only three out of the box actions that we use and everything else is essentially just like bash scripts one thing i've always believed partly probably because i've moved around ci cd tooling so much like i've I, i've been on circle and moved to github i've been on gitlab moved to github I've been on github and moved to jenkins or whatever is like, man, it's really nice when your CI and CD files are mostly just bash scripts that like, yeah, they run on the server like that, but you also could just like basically run them locally. Like you might have to change the formatting a little, but at the end of the day, it's like bash and YAML. And so we've done that with our, especially like our CD on GitHub is, you know, we're using like kubectl, we're using Helm, and it's just like the same command line command that we're running. But I imagine that there's a lot of companies that do have a lot more lock-in because every time you add a like proprietary GitHub action action, now if you want to move that, you're going to have to reverse engineer the effect of the action, which my biggest frustration, sorry to like, now I'm just going to vent a little bit. One of my biggest frustrations with GitHub actions is not, it is that last time I looked, they're like almost all written in node. It's like, the action file. So like when I do like setup go, it's like written as a node script. And I'm like, 
first of all, I fucking hate Node. Like, I don't like JavaScript. So, like, why why would I want this to be in Node? But then it it reduces like the reusability because now I can't just like copy out you know whatever command line commands essentially were being run and like put them into my action file i have to like reverse engineer some javascript code so that's really frustrating like i wish that github actions were built more around like repurposing bash scripts or or shell scripts or whatever rather than introducing and like javascript of all things like this is the one that we've decided to standardize on i sympathize (laughs) <laughs> I feel your pain there. I will say one thing that we've been thinking about trying to do with Mint to help get over this vendor login pro- problem, because they are all JavaScript scripts, we're pretty optimistic that we could actually make actions run on Mint by you know basically mocking out the parts of the Git- GitHub Actions SDK that those actions use, and then just executing oh, yeah. them and getting them to work. Which is something. But we're then really you're gonna gonna going to perpetuate the standard. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll make sure that our YAML has like a special key you have to put in. Like, I oh, promise yeah. I didn't make this action. I'm just like, I was already using it <laughs> and I just need to keep using it. It's a big problem though. I mean, yeah. I really value putting everything in bash scripts because they, they're not only more reusable if you're moving to CI platforms, but you can also run them locally and right. make sure that like they work. And I've seen a lot of GitHub actions configs where you cannot run any of it locally at all. And, you know, you're in this pretty brutal cycle of, like, make a change, push, wait, okay, failure, what do I need to change now? <laughs> make a change, yeah. push, <laughs> wait, because it is just, like, the only thing you can do is change the YAML, and there's no way to execute it locally at all. I apologize if this is not the product direction you guys are, are, are taking, but, like, in, one thing that, like, would be really interesting to me, now that we're nerding out about this, is a CI platform or CD platform that builds on the idea of modularity that GitHub Actions is going for, right? The fact that you can make like a little self-contained thing that does a thing. It's like functions in programming language, right? Like you have a nice encapsulated function. You just tell it to set up Go and it sets up Go. Or you just tell it to install the gcloud command line and you give it your secret key or whatever. And it just like does it. That's really nice. But like one that's more centered around like the Unix philosophy, text input, output, right? That isn't locked to a programming language or a framework or an ecosystem. Unix philosophy is like text-based, right? It's it's text-based. It's scripts. It's, I can pipe input and output. Like that's the kind of thing that I'd love to see, I I think. Mint is built on top of containers. So it's not quite your text piping (laughs) philosophy, but it is a Linuxy philosophy that is in principle portable. Every task that runs, we produce like a Docker layer that you could run in your own container if you wanted to say, examine the output of the task. And actually the whole way that Mint works under the hood is just by like mixing and matching different Docker layers to kind of create the image that your particular task needs to run on. So we have thought quite a bit about like, and oh, I think I said earlier that we originally Mint was a build tool. And the idea was that like it would be local first and when you push the ci the days could just be like we already ran this locally so you're good to go because we know it's the same when you run locally versus on ci and there's still a little bit of that in in our future that is interesting that you could have like a command line tool that's connected to a server and like you run it locally and it just like logs the fact that like like maybe it hashes the files right like hashes the files is like i ran this locally with this hash i'm reporting to the server and saying i did that great. Like, yeah, we're, we're, we're good now. Like, I don't need to run expensive CI anymore. Especially because a lot of times, like, people are working on, like, M3 MacBooks. CI runs in, like, five seconds. And then you push it to your, like, quarter of a CPU core GitHub action runner. And now it takes two and a half minutes. <laughs> Not only is it a quarter of a CPU core, but Microsoft is definitely using their old CPUs as their kind of actions runners. So like you check some of those things it's like, oh yeah, this CPU is from 2012 that, that is currently running my tests. Your Pentium um, 4 processor. Or, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, I've definitely noticed that. I, I've been amazed. This ran so quickly locally. What is happening up there on my, yeah. on my GitHub action server? And most of the time you're already running locally all the things that could have changed. So like our like true future state vision for Mint is you make a change to a source file, only one possible test could have been changed from that change. You make the change to the test you need to make, you run it, it's good to go. You push your branch, 
Mint knows that the only thing that could have changed based on your changes was that one test file, and it knows you already ran it, and you're good to go, and you have a zero second CI time. That's that's zero like our seconds. future state vision. We're definitely not there yet, but I'm really excited when we get there because I think it's just going to be totally magical for people. That that does sound exciting. Zero second CI sounds really interesting. I'm struggling right now with, I mean, I shouldn't say I'm struggling. Like I have not had the time to look into this, but it is annoying. Basically we, we build these Docker images and deploy them to Kubernetes. That's like our CD process. And so we're compiling like static Go binaries, which as I'm sure you know, like Go compiles down to machine codes. So, like you don't need a dependency on your container to run your application. So like in the best case scenario, you could like run on a from scratch Docker container, which is basically just like a Linux kernel and not much else. And like, that's fine. Cause like, I'm just running machine. In fact, I don't need, does it even ship with a Linux kernel? I don't even know what it ships with. It's like almost nothing, but like, you're just running a compiled binary and, and that would work except for the fact that we're also copying like a bunch of stuff that we need at runtime because boot dev is this like interactive coding environment. So students can run Go code and students can run Python code. And so our server needs access to those tools. So like it, we actually do, I guess what all, like all this to say, my containers should be small because they just have Go applications on them. But in fact, they're very large because I need a bunch of random other tools like to make the interactivity of the site work. And Every time we build and push, it's like installing Python and Go on the GitHub Actions Runner from scratch. And it's like that stuff literally never changes. Like our code does not change the Go tool chain. It's just the Go tool chain. And I do not understand why it's not just like a flag or something to like make literally half of our CI time go away. Well, with Mint, that's exactly what would happen. <laughs> cool, <laughs> you know, all okay. Of that all that set up Python stuff, that'll be cached 100% of the time if you never change like the version you're installing or anything like that. And then the only work you're going to be doing is building your Go container. And then, you know, there's a variety of ways you could actually get like the image that you actually need to deploy to Kubernetes. But in principle, you know, you could set up a system as well that like already has all of those layers that have the Python install and whatnot. And it only brings in the new layer for for like the new version of of your software yeah the new code right and so then it's like it's only transmitting you know i don't know how big is your go code less actually than, it's less funny than a megabyte five yeah. megabytes or something instead of instead of a gigabyte the go code itself yeah is like tiny like i'm sure just if, i don't know five megabytes or something whatever i don't know how much into the go ecosystem you are but go has a really cool thing called go embed so if you like depend on static files in the file system at runtime, I don't know, many other programming languages, essentially you'd like have your application and then you'd like have to put all of the content files like next to the application. And then when you run it, it's going to like go look at the file system. Uh, go has this really cool thing called go embed where it'll actually just embed all those files directly into the binary. So we do that and that blows the size quite a bit. But yeah. other than that, <laughs> that's a cool like... <laughs> thing until someone embeds a, like 10 gigabyte image into it right like oh i just want to use this cool png so <laughs> yeah and that probably breaks well i'm certain that breaks all caching if you're trying to do like content caching uh, sure, it's like yeah. embedded directly in one file yeah. now yeah um, yeah <laughs> But it is cool for like simplicity's sake when you don't have all that much content. So I have one more note. I think this is like the final note that I have that you and I were talking about before we hopped on and, uh, and pressed the record button. A CI platform is something that's used every single day by a developer, 10 times, 20 times, 30 times a day, right? Like many, many times per day, a developer is interacting with their CI and their CD tools as just like a regular part of their workflow. But like, we only configure them maybe once every month or something, or once every few months. What do you think about that whole idea? And is that driving the philosophy of Mint in any way? I, I'm a little afraid to say it's driving the philosophy of Mint because I'm sure that we are inconsistent <laughs> on this front. But a lot of the competitors in the space, not get actions, but a lot of the newer competitors in the CI space right now have these like programming language SDKs that you use to like configure your workflows and stuff. And they're like ridiculously powerful. You know, you just like write like some crazy application basically that then configures your continuous integration platform. But we've tried to avoid that a bit because that stuff is really hard to read. <laughs> if you like are trying to figure out like what is happening in CI and you then you just like there's this like 10 file 
three thirty thousand line application that is doing it all, it's really hard to get to the bottom of it, especially because you might only be looking at it, you know, once a year or something like that when you're like really debugging a weird issue or like trying to make like a pretty substantial change to how your team does CI. So with Mint, we have like YAML config, just like GitHub Actions. It's I would say greatly inspired by GitHub Actions. And I hear a lot of people complain about GitHub Actions YAML, but one thing that you definitely can say about it is it's very easy to read. Like when you look at a GitHub Actions YAML file, and I'm sure when you guys are teaching CI as well, like it's straightforward. So like run this thing <laughs> on Ubuntu 22, run this command. <laughs> and that's like all there is to it. And when you want to get like fancy, it has the tools for you, like it has matrices and things like that, but they don't spend too much effort trying to make it like just insanely powerful, right? And I think that actually is a great virtue of it and something that we are trying to stick to with Mint as well. We want the escape hatches when you need to do something more powerful, but we didn't want to go all the way to like, you need to learn a whole programming language in order to configure this thing. And we really think that most people, like the thing they care about is the results and actually using it not configuring it. Yeah. So it's funny. I get students, students ask for like us to make courses on different topics and technologies all the time. And our current CI CD course uses GitHub Actions, but like it's a course on CI CD. Like we really, like one of our core philosophies of boot dev is like, we're trying to make content that's like very broadly applicable. And like, we're going to use real world technologies to teach the concepts. But like, at the end of the day, we want to teach like what CI is, how it's useful, like how you should think about it, what a good CI CD pipeline looks like versus a bad one, regardless of like whatever technology you happen to be using to implement it. And in my mind, first of all, there, there would be some bad CI CD platforms that like don't don't meet this categorization. But like my core belief is if if you learn how CI and CD work in a reasonable system, you don't need a course on Jenkins, right? You don't need a course on the next one. Like you'll just be able to use it. <laughs> like it should be pretty easy to use. And and what I was saying earlier about how like, okay, you barely, you only touch this maybe once every three months or once every six months, but you use it every day. That could be interpreted as you only have to configure it once. So like, it's not so bad if you have to spend a ton of time configuring it because you're only going to do that once and you're going to use it every day. But I actually look at it a completely different way, which is like, I only see this every six months, which means when I come back in six months, there's no chance, like there's no shot that I'm going to remember how I configured it last time. So it really does need to be simple and easy to use because I'm not in it every day. It's easier to work with complex systems if you're in them every single day. I, th I think that's that's a great way to put what I was trying to say. And there's a huge difference between like, I'm writing some like really gnarly piece of code that's like at the foundation of my application or something, but like I know no one is ever touching this thing again. So like I can put every like crazy performance optimization in there and make it as obscure as possible because I'm 100% confident this is never changing. But a CI platform is definitely not like that. Like they do change. They just change at a slower frequency than say your application code. And so it is really important that you can come back to it, read it, understand what it's doing, confidently change like one thing without worrying that like this is going to have some crazy effects over here because you know, these things are connected in very loose and complicated ways. Like GitHub Actions, you just, you read it top down. If you know, you change something in the middle, it's not changing and it's not affecting anything up top, <laughs> you know? So very easy to like quickly see like the effect that a change is going to have. And, and like I said, it's easy to understand as well. And that's definitely something we're trying to keep in mind with Mint too. Even if it means copying and pasting a bunch. Like every GitHub Actions workflow, right, in a project is like the same six steps in a job and then like the one unique thing. But like, that's fine because how often are you changing like all, like one of those first six steps? If you need to do it once every few months, it's not that bad to do like a global find and replace or whatever on it. And and it's another part I appreciate of GitHub Actions, just like copy and paste is everywhere and it works really well for what it is. I couldn't agree more. One thing that's surprised me is sometimes I'll like onboard a new engineer, not necessarily boot dev, but like at any of the companies I've worked at in the past few years. And I've always been really into CI and CD. I think it's a huge value add for DevX. And I've been surprised that like a lot of engineers that haven't worked in CI CD will kind of look at it very like it's this esoteric arcane thing. But again, this comes back to like what I was saying about why I value 
CI platforms that like just use like bash scripts and like Unix philosophy as much as possible because I'll have an engineer come to me and be like, Hey, like CI is failing. And like, I see the error message, but I don't really get why I'm like, well, like just go to that line in the GitHub actions file and like copy and paste it into your terminal and run it. <laughs> like what yeah. happens, right? Like yeah. that's the nice thing about not abstracting things into fucking node JS files is like, <laughs> I can just run them all this to say, I like it when my CI and my CD workflows are not just workflows that run on the server and are useful for this kind of developer feedback, uh, de developer experience feedback, but when they're also like living documentation for how the code is going to get from my computer to the production server, right? What tests are going to run, what lints, what linting is going to run, because when it all gets hidden behind a UI or in some like abstracted away GitHub action, now it's like, I got to like go write some markdown in the readme to tell people how this works. And that gets out of date. There's zero chance that that's going to stay up to date. Um, so I, I do like to think of it as, as kind of a living documentation of your, of your testing and deployment pipeline. Yeah. It's also just great documentation for like, how do I set up this project and run yeah. the tests or anything? Cause like you see it there that you can try to do the same thing to set it up locally. If our server needs like five tool, if our server needs five tools to run the project, you probably need those five tools too. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do have to pitch and this goes completely against what you were just talking about, but one other feature of Mint <laughs> that I just love and really want to talk about, which is our debugging feature. So it is great when you can reproduce an issue locally. And I always think people should do that as their first, first approach. Like test is failing in CI, try to run it locally, see if it fails there. But sometimes it's really hard to reproduce whatever is going on in your CI locally. And I don't know, in GitHub Actions, usually what I ended up doing was I just like put a bunch of like print statements or echo stuff to try to figure out what's going on and what's different. With Mint, we added this bash function called Mint Breakpoint that you can put anywhere in whatever bash script you're running. You could put it directly in your YAML, or you can put it in a script that's being called for your YAML anywhere at all. And when you hit mint breakpoint in the execution of your task, it opens an SSH console that you can connect to. And there's like, you know, our CLI has a command. So you just run like mint debug this ID. And immediately you're there inside of your task. You can look at the file system. You can look at the environment variables. You can run your test suite and like see what's going on. And I, I just think like, it's not the first tool you should go to, but it is an amazing tool when you do go to it because it gives you the exact environment that your task is running in. I've never heard of that. That is, I've definitely debugged some problems with like GitHub Actions. And the problem is the feedback loop, right? It's like, sometimes it takes six minutes to get to the part that's breaking. And so you just like, make a change, wait six minutes. Oh, but broke, make a change, wait 12 minutes, like whatever. The funny thing is like people who've been listening to this pod know I am not a fan of debuggers generally with, with my experience as a backend developer because I work in Go and Go compiles almost instantly. And so like print debugging works really well, but I'm sympathetic to like the kind of John Carmack debugging on a video game situation where it's like it takes a long time to get to the broken part and so if you you know spend 20 minutes getting into the right state and then like your print statement's printing the wrong value it's like ah oh, that's a disaster so i could see how with ci like i've experienced this problem of like very long feedback loops so print debug like the way i look at it is i love print debugging and avoiding the complexity of a debugger the shorter the feedback loop like the faster i can just like run the code and get to the thing but the longer the feedback loop becomes, the more and more I want to lead into some sort of like interactive debugging experience. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I'm a huge fan of print line debugging myself. I use it in circumstances where I definitely shouldn't. <laughs> but uh, uh, but yeah, like I said, it's a great tool to have the toolkit for the cases where you do just have those really difficult to figure out problems and you need to just like get into a bash console and explore what's going on. Cool. Well, Tommy, thanks so much for coming on. Let's tell everybody, like, where can, if they're interested, where can they find Mint? Yeah, it's at rwx.com slash Mint. That is the letter R, the letter W, the letter X.com. One of the rare three letter domain names that I'm, I'm proud to have. So <laughs> I was going to say, that's a, it's a great domain name from a length standpoint, but like what, what, why R, W, and X? It is just read, write, execute. When we first started the company, we were thinking, 
of having a bit more of a research focus so that we would kind of synthesize what other people are doing in the DevTools space, write about it, and then build some tools on top of it. So we're firmly in the execute phase now with building Mint, um, but we kind of take that as our like overall mantra, you know, of, of reading, writing, and executing all being critical parts of, of building a dev tool. No, that, that, that's, that's really cool. And it's it makes sense, or I should say, it's probably a good thing that you're on like rwx.com because like there's that really famous like financial app, Mint, right? That you don't want to... You don't want to compete with for brand name space. I'll tell you, I'm trying to buy their domain though, because they are sunsetting mint. <laughs> no way. That domain's gotta be so expensive. I know. <laughs> There's no we have no chance of actually buying it, but maybe <laughs> if someone doesn't know what it's worth. <laughs> Oh, good. Yeah. Well, I wish you luck. I wish you luck. Thank All you. right, everybody. <laughs> thank Again, thank you so much for coming on. People can find Mint at rwx.com slash Mint. Did you have any other resources that you wanted to plug before we sign off? I don't think so. But thank you so much for having me. This is this is a really fun conversation to have. Absolutely. Thanks, Tommy. We'll talk to you later. Yeah. Take care. <laughs>